January, on January 31, 1829, Governor Martin Van Buren of New York wrote this letter to President Jackson. The canal system of this country is being threatened by the spread of a new form of transportation known as railroads. The federal government must preserve the canals for the following reasons. He then issues a strong and a critical warning that the evil new railroads would disrupt business, boost unemployment, and weaken our nation's defense. It continues, as you may well know, Mr. President, railroad carriages are pulled at the enormous speed of 15 miles an hour by engines which, in addition to endangering life and limb of passengers, roar and snort their way through the countryside, setting fire to crops, scaring the livestock, and frightening women and children. <laughs> the Almighty certainly never intended that people should travel at such a breakneck speed. Now, my grandfather was born in 1898. He died in 1983 at the age of 85. Now, in contrast to Governor Van Buren, he would often remark about how many positive changes that he had seen in his lifetime. And indeed, it was dizzying. In his 85 years, he saw the invention of synthetic rubber, radios, the vacuum cleaner, the zipper, plastic, cellophane, penicillin, photography, the telephone, the automobile, refrigeration, transistors, the credit card, nuclear power, television, both black and white and color, jet propulsion, manned space flight, TV dinners, heart transplants, antibiotics, and on and on and on. One thing he didn't live to see was the Red Sox winning the World Series. <laughs> so on the one hand, we see resistance to change because the future is scary and the present feels comfortable and certain. And on the other hand, we see perhaps a naive optimism like that of Dale Carnegie Every day and every way, I and the world am getting better and better. When we look at the world of religion in the United States, there are dizzying sea changes as well. In 1960, sociologist Will Herberg described the typical pattern of what Americans believe. Most emphatically, he said they believe in God, 97% according to one survey. About 75% of them regarded themselves as members of churches and a sizable proportion attend divine services with some frequency and regularity, said Herberg. By 2014, however, uh, the number of Americans claiming belief in God went from a most emphatic 97% to 71%. That's a 26-point drop. 95%, they believe in something holy, bigger than themselves, transcendent, 86% say they pray, 10 to 40% claim they belong to a religious organization. About 9% attend early, uh, regularly attend church in Massachusetts and 7% in New Hampshire. So it used to be the Northwest was the most unchurched region of the country. New England rivals them now. So there's a huge mission field out there. The fastest growing religious group are called the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, not N-U-N-S. And these people claim no affiliation to any religion or religious body. They aren't necessarily atheists or agnostics, but former church folks and unaffiliated. Many identify themselves as spiritual, but not religious. And many today are finding conventional religion increasingly less satisfying. They're attending church less regularly and they are longing for new expressions of spiritual community. Consequently, nine U.S. churches close every day. Now, our own uh, Reverend Abby Heinrich is doing a really experimental thing on Sunday evenings, uh, as part of the, what we call the emerging church movement, where they meet in a coffee house, they have contemporary um, and, and extemporary preaching, it's very informal, um, there's no set of requirements that have to believe um, or to belong. You might want to check it out sometime. In 1962, pollsters found that 22 percent of Americans claimed that they had some kind of a mystical experience of God. But by 2009, 48 percent of Americans confessed that they had some kind of mystical encounter with the divine. People have hungry hearts, like Bruce Springsteen puts it. Everyone has a hungry heart. But business as usual in our churches today, even if it's done very well, isn't 
necessarily feeding them. So how do we then live? Today I want to look at two larger-than-life figures of the Old Testament, Abraham and Sarah. Now in spite of their flawed humanity and some stupid decisions they made along their way, they demonstrate a quality of faith and trust in God that is admirable even today, even if they didn't know where they were going and where the future might land them. They had what I would like to call a forward-looking faith. Sarah and Abraham were deeply rooted in their history, in their heritage, in their culture. Their forebears had been in Ur of the Chaldees for generations, and they had it all, a nice home, lots of land, fresh water, livestock, fruit trees, grandkids, a rather nice retirement plan. But for whatever reason, they went anyway. So let's look for a moment at this matriarch and patriarch and, and see what we might learn about a forward-looking faith. First of all, a forward-looking faith is ready to take risks. God's call to Abraham was a call to disentangle himself from his country, his kindred, his parents' house, all that had been comfortable and given meaning to his life. Yet he went. Talk about living outside of your comfort zone. By faith, the author of Hebrews put it, Abraham obeyed when he was called to set out for a place that he was to receive as an inheritance, and he set out not knowing where he was going. Isn't that amazing? He didn't know where he was going, yet he meant. And we've all had these moments, haven't we? I mean, we've had a compulsion, a funny interior feeling, whatever you want to call it, to do something. We say no to that job that looked too good to be true, only to find something more satisfying later on. Or we struck up a, a conversation with someone who became our spouse. Or we decided to become a florist after we had graduated from medical school because that is what really fulfilled us. You know, the biggest risk I sometimes take during the course of the week is I will sign an online petition about asking Congress to do something about climate control, and if I'm really bold, I'll post it on Facebook. But Peggy and I have a friend working with AIDS orphans in South Africa. She had a great job in the development department at Harvard Divinity School. Then one night she had a dream, and an African tree frog beckoned her into the rainforest and showed her children without parents because those parents had died of AIDS. And she's not one to have weird experiences like this. She was very active in Pleasant Street Church in Arlington. She began praying about this and consulting with her pastor. She visited orphanages in South Africa several times, and she started an organization called Tremendous Hearts and now lives there and serves an amazing number of orphans in various agencies there. And by the way, she's looking for volunteers if those who are retired or have some free time and would like to have the experience of their lives. I'll give you her email. Now, in the same way, God was calling Abraham and Sarah to something greater than themselves. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and all people on earth will be blessed through you. That was the promise of God. And look at all the I wills that are heaped up in those two verses that I read for you in Genesis 11. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. I will bless those who bless you. God never sends us down blind alley. The promise of, of God always precede us. But let me clearly acknowledge it is hard to go through change. As the deacon in a small Vermont church once said, change is sin and we sin as little as possible around here. <laughs> it's scary, let's not deny that, but it can also become an adventure of faith. Changing circumstances can be an occasion to discover heretofore unknown possibilities and opportunities. Change may require letting go of the familiar and the comfortable for something greater than ourselves. One church where I interviewed years back had one of its goals as to pioneer. In their mission statement, they wrote, aware of our own heritage as pioneering people, we aim to experiment courageously, and when an experiment proves unsuccessful, to press ahead in new directions and with new methods. Now, when I read that, I was excited. This was a church that wanted to go places. It was willing to take chances, and if they fell down, they would get back up and try something else. You know the last eight words of a dying church. 
We tried that before and it didn't work. We'll try something else, put God to the test. Second, a forward-looking faith is a faith which has staying power. By faith, the author of Hebrews tells us again, Abraham stayed for a time in the land he had been promised as in a foreign land, living in tents as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. When Abraham reached the promised land, he was never allowed to possess it. He had to wander in it, a stranger and a tent dweller, as the people were someday to wander in the wilderness. To Abraham and Sarah, God's promises never fully came true, and yet they never abandoned their faith. The Israelites, as slaves in Egypt, were given a similar call with a vision of a land flowing with milk and honey before them. But when they were in the wilderness, with their provisions running low, their responses were much different than Abraham's. If only we had died in Egypt, wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? They were hungry for leeks, they were tired of manna, and they wanted to go back home where the work was oppressive, but at least the routine was familiar. Uh, the place where they had loved and buried their parents, the place where the tent cords and stakes were secure. And they grew impatient that God's promise seemed slow in coming. So in the face of hunger and danger, they were ready to retreat to the familiar, even if it meant slavery. It's hard to wait. We become impatient for God to work. We want things to happen in our time. And when nothing seems to be happening, when we, then we need the ability to wait and to watch and to work. It's then that we're liable, though, to give up our hopes, to lower ide our ideals, sink into an apathy that dries up our dreams. The person of, the f of faith is the one who keeps hope alive and whose effort is consistent even in gray days when there's nothing to do but wait. Too many of our churches long for the good old days. I'm, I know that this is not the case here at the First Congregational Church, but it may be. They remember when the church was filled, the Sunday school was overflowing, uh, they all had dark hair on their heads and flat stomachs. And some of you may have old wounds that you still carry. The insensitive remark someone made to you still rings in your ears. You felt unappreciated for the work that you've done over the years. You felt slighted for not being chosen for a committee or a board position. No one visited you when you were in the hospital and so forth. And these things hurt as they should, and you wish that the church of Jesus Christ had done better. But we are all broken people, aren't we? And this is a fresh moment. If you need to work through forgiveness or reconciliation or grief before moving on, then knock on my door. Feel free to come talk to me. But who knows what God can do if we let God be God. And lastly, a forward-looking faith is a faith which trusts God with the future. Even though Abraham never saw the promised land, he looked forward to that city that has foundations whose architect and builder is God. All of the heroes of faith lift, listed in Hebrews 11, parts of which Greg left, read for us, Abraham and Sarah, Moses and Moses, all of them died in faith without having received the promises. But from a distance, they saw them and they greeted them. Indeed, God has prepared a city for them. This, of course, is not a literal city, but it's the kingdom of God when Jesus Christ will reign and all the promises will find their yes in him. The promise of Abraham was that he longed for was the promise of a savior, a redeemer, one who would act justly and compassionately, one who would be Emmanuel, God with them, one who would overrule despair and ambiguity and, and evil in the world. Abraham could trust God with the future because Abraham had found God trustworthy yesterday and today. To Abraham was given the vision, and even when his body was wandering in Palestine, his soul was at, at home with God. And we have, and I hope we can discover during our time together, a preferred future. Where is God calling this congregation? What are our assets? What are the needs of the community? What are things that are particular and peculiar to this congregation that only we can do where God is leading us? But in the midst of all of life's changes, we can trust our unchanging God. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. 
God is not moody and grouchy on one day and confused about life the next. You don't find God at home one day and the answering machine on the next. God cannot change for the better because God is perfectly holy and just and merciful and long-suffering and so forth. God has never been any less of those qualities than today, and God can never get better. Neither can God change for the worst. See, God's character never changes, but our God can dynamically respond to every fresh situation. Of course God is love. That can never change. But God's love in action is continually changing in relation to us. And this ability to change does not mean that God is fickle or capricious. It simply means that God is able to operate within a changing history, responding to everything that happens. So praise God for God's changing unchangeability. I could go on, but my friends, can we not trust a God like this who is unchanging in the midst of all of our changes? Can the certainty of God's constancy, constancy sustain us when our world seems so topsy-turvy? Would Jesus have told us, do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid if this were not a genuine possibility? Can we not have a forward-looking faith even when the way is not clear? Corey ten Boom, who's a Dutch Christian arrested and sent to a concentration camp by the Nazis for hiding Jews in her home during World War II, recalls in her book, The Hiding Place, feeling as a child she could never be a martyr for Christ. She confided her fear to her father. He responded by asking her when he gave her the money for a train ticket from the trip to Harlem to Amsterdam. Was it three weeks before the trip? No, she replied, it is just before I get on the train. That is right, her father continued, and so it is with God's strength. Our wise Father in heaven knows when we are going to need things too. Today you do not need strength to be a martyr, but as soon as you are called upon the honor of facing death for Jesus, he will supply the strength that you need just in time. Well, we're not facing martyrdom, although it may feel like it at times, um, we are facing transition time, which will transform us and require strength. Most of us love to live within a certain comfort zone, but to live the Christian life is to live with a certain recklessness, willing to go on adventure if necessary. Mark Twain said the only person who likes change is a wet baby. I think we would agree that we could add God to that list. Like it or not, God always seems to be calling us to new ventures, new birth, new possibility, or as a popular song offers, every new beginning comes from some other beginning's end. And if we want God to act in our midst, we must be open to God's surprises. And the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall live forever. Amen.